So welcome to the show, James. Thank you, Kim, so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I almost messed up your your tech ta- the town square hall you the tech do. Town I'm- square. Yes. Yeah. We did it last night. It was a blast. I know. I, I tried to uh, stay on that. I listened to it for a little bit, but we had some storms here. So all my power was out. So welcome to the show. I've known James for a while. He is very um, prominent in the Atlanta market. And I'm sure we have many viewers here today that um, are, you guys can give a shout out to James in the chat room. So we were talking, James, um, before, pre-show and you were telling me you guys are actually getting ready to do one of your first live events in Atlanta. So how how's that going to look for you all? So we're after a, uh, over a year of not doing anything, I think a little bit more. I think the last time I did anything like in person that I hosted was September of 2019. And so I'm excited for April 27th. Um, I've partnered with Atlanta Tech Park to host a CIO CISO kind of round table slash mini event that's going to be half virtual, half in person um, in, in in beautiful Peachtree Corners here in here in Georgia. And it's it's going to be a, a, a fun little event. Um, you know, we'll have some people in person, we'll have some people virtually and kind of trying to break out of the Zoom mold, if that's okay. I, yeah, I am so excited to hear that because we're actually in Dallas in August. We're going to start going, doing the exact same thing. So it's yes. going to be a, yeah, it's going to be a kind of a road of lessons learned of how to incorporate the virtual. But if you don't try it, you know, it's just like anything. A year ago, no one knew how to do virtual events. And here we are a year later. So, you know, we're, we're very excited. We actually, for our viewers, if you go to the network lounge, there's a poll in there. And there is one question that says how many people would attend virtually and how many people would attend live. It seems to be about 50, 50. I'm looking for that number to rise to 75, 25. It'll it'll be interesting because we started polling that about a month ago. So I think that really depends on like where you go. Right. So Atlanta has been re- like Georgia, the state of Georgia has been really, really good about vaccination and testing. And so we feel really confident about kind of doing a, a one day event. We're still going to do social distancing, masks inside, all that good stuff. Um, we're doing quite a few events if weather permits outside so people can actually take off their masks. They can social distance. They can be a little bit more, you know, able to to be around, but I think we all kind of miss, I mean, Kim, I think the last time I saw you was January of last year, right before this pandemic greeted us um, at FutureCon here in beautiful Atlanta. Um, and it was an awesome event. I mean, you had, and I it was had, packed. Do you it remember? Was packed. We were <laughs> yeah. like, there was no room for anywhere to sit. I mean, I'm glad Daniel uh, Sergile at the time saved me a seat next to him because otherwise I don't think I would have been able to sit. Well, can you imagine? I mean, we were like sardines at that venue and there's no way that could ever happen again. But it was a fun (laughs) event. (laughs) One year later, looking back, that's kind of crazy. And before I turn it over to you really quick, one of the things that we're trying to do differently, because we're so used to being in hotels, is trying to get out of the hotels. Like we're kind of looking at some um, top golf. They have conference rooms and just trying to get away because now we're going to need a lot of Wi-Fi and the hotels, you know, you know how they are with Wi-Fi. They charge. It's ridiculous. So it'll be fun. We're trying to do different things when we go back on the road, just change it, kind of get out of the box of what we're used to. So I will be watching how your event goes. I'm sure it'll be super successful, but just um, having different venues is kind of, you know, changing it up. I think one thing that's really important about all these events that we do is the idea of exchanging information, right? And the venue, the atmosphere plays a big role into that. And so I I totally agree with you. I'm glad to hear you say we're leaving hotels. We're trying. I won't say we 100% will, but we're trying. I'll tell you this. I'll give you a few ideas here. And I'm sure people will start like rolling in the comments when I say this. Breweries, wineries, um, great restaurants like um, are always awesome with, you know, smaller groups, I think always, especially being that, you know, for the next year or so, people are going to be very conscious about being in a room with a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, smaller groups across different rooms and and smaller, like in in larger venues, like restaurants or um, in Atlanta, they've got this food incubator 
that I've been looking at for like doing something with um, um, one of my partners where we bring a bunch of people in and we've got a bunch of food trucks on the outsides of the venue where people can go and grab food, but then inside you, you do a bunch of stuff. There's so many great things we can do to share ideas. Love that. And And yeah, love that. We are having our last event of the year in Atlanta. So um, I'll be picking your brain. Oh, I can't wait. I am a resource for whatever Kim needs. All right. (laughs) Okay. Well, I don't want to take up your time. Now, everyone that's watching, please put your chats in the box. Um, We, my production team will be feeding James any questions you have during the session, but I'll come back at the end of the session and I'll do Q and a with James. As I said, um, Today, he is going to be speaking on the CISO dilemma, changing our approach with executive suite and boardroom. So I am going to send it over to you, James, and it's all yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, I know this is FutureCon Tampa, but we are everywhere. But I love Tampa. So for all of those that are Tampa natives, um, I love Tampa. Tampa. I love Florida. So let's talk a little bit about the CISO dilemma and why I chose when, when Kim approached me, she said, James, you know, here's something. What do you want to talk about? And I said, you know, let's talk about the challenges that exist today because SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange the last four months, if you're a practitioner, have been back to back to back to back, just incident responses, just one after the other. And the boardroom and the executive suite is, is coming to us as CISOs and asking us these questions, trying to, at, trying to ascertain what are some of the risks, what are some of the ways we do this. And now is the time where we get to really elevate ourselves beyond because the, the, the role of a CISO is endless tasks. So one thing we need to understand is we need to ensure that every aspect of business um, and, and that we are a security, as security teams, we are enablers. And being enablers means that we have to understand and support the mission of the business. And that's why we need to consult and strategize and plan ahead. And how do we communicate that with the business, especially in an era where, you know, if, if we look back over a, period, over a long period of time, CISOs traditionally are the first people on the chopping block when something happens. And so we're given this role, we're given this, um, we're still looked at as being part of IT in some cases, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on today. And we need to address all these different challenges that exist within the CISO, but now the last four months have given us the ability to really elevate our role within the organization and elevate it beyond anything else, being able to really talk about this. So here's what I wanna go to. Here's our dilemma. In most places, compliance doesn't equal security. But for a lot of people within the business, are you SOC to compliant? Great. That means that we're secure. They don't allow us to really talk about the business. And are we aligning our business goals with the business lingo? Meaning, are we using the right vocabulary, the right language when we're talking to the business? And what does it really mean for a CISO to speak business? So I want to take my presentation today is full of movie quotes. All right, so I, ho- I hope you're ready for it. Um, I'm, I'm a movie buff. I've done a bunch of movie quotes, and um, this is what we're going to be talking about. Here's a classic one. The Matrix, Red Bill, Blue Pill, right? Which pill do you pick? And for a lot of CISOs, that's the case. Do I? Which pill do I pick? We have, let's start with the blue pill, right? So our blue pill is our FUD bill, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Why do we use FUD sometimes with the business? That's been one common complaint that I hear from board members, from executive leaderships. When they talk about security, they go, the sky is falling all the time. We're chicken, chicken littling it consistently. And the question is, why did we do this? Did, did the business force us to do this? Meaning the idea of really putting security under IT and considering security to only be an IT function, not a business function. Could it be that early on in the role of the CISO, the only way we saw fit to get anything done was through FUD because our executives wouldn't listen unless the sky was falling. That's also a scenario. And how do we engage and why do we engage today knowing everything we know in some conduct that's really similar to stuff we criticize in emails we get as CISOs where they say, don't be this company, use X. 
Ryan, we've got some great vendors supporting the show today, but FUD is constantly something that we talk about when we talk about awareness and education, but it's really critical that we change that mindset and we get rid of this blue pill. And I want to talk about that because it, it, it's critical. Where I see a world where in 10 years, the CISO role is actively being looked at to lead an organization as a CEO. And some of you may, may, may dismiss that and say, it's probably going to take longer. I don't. I'm starting to see that happen right now. CISOs are being elevated. And they're being elevated, especially over the last year or so. But the last four months have allowed us to really step up our game, to really be able to walk into an organization, to walk into our executive leadership, to walk into our board and have the kind of conversations that really elevate not only our role and elevate where we are, but also help us solve some of the dilemmas that exist from a budgeting perspective, from a manpower perspective, from a business enablement perspective, from building relationships and partnerships within the organization to really drive home the message of we are here to be part of the business and be business enablers. We're not the department of no. And so this is where FUD is really damaging our position. But when we talk about the red pill, we talk about the business talk. And the business talk's really critical. This is how we build processes and this is how we win. This is how CISOs can start to win and overcome this dilemma. How do we cover lower costs? Are we using that term? Are we talking about reduced risk? Are we looking at customer satisfaction? These are all things that the business really cares about that we as security enablers, once we align our language, once we align everything we're doing to that lingo, now we can, we'll be able to really talk security in a way where people don't look at us as chicken little and the sky is falling. So I changed the way I approached cyber with the business about three years ago. And I did this because I wanted to understand the flow of the business. So I spent a lot of time studying what are the business goals? Where's the business heading? What's our one-year plan? What's our three-year plan? What's our five-year plan? What's our revenue goals? What are some of the keywords that really define our business? What are some of the things that we need to do as an organization in order to align security to the business itself? And so understanding that I needed to create significant relationships within the organization and build trust. And unfortunately, that takes time. And in security, a lot of times we don't have the time, but we need to win over that time. And we do that by really focusing on the relationship aspect of our role. So how do we improve quality in our business? How do we enhance process and consistency? How do we talk about maintaining security within the organization and simplifying operations? All of these are intertwined and they all play a significant role for us as CISOs, significant. Now, I wanna talk about specifically the dilemma that we've been facing the last four months. December 10th, we all were getting ready for our fourth quarter, uh, end of the year, end of the fourth quarter, we're ready to go home. We wake up one morning, solar winds is news, fire eye in the news. They're all victims of a very sophisticated software supply chain attack. And at that point, if you're not a SolarWinds customer, you're taking a deep breath and you're saying, okay, this, this doesn't impact me. But if you're serving any of the businesses that were SolarWinds customers, you could be impacted by this specific incident indirectly. So let's talk a little bit about how the supply chain really works. Right, so we're all intertwined in a world of SaaS and infrastructure as a service and platforms as a service, whether it be cloud, whether it be DevOps and so much more. So if we talk about the various gears in business and we look at what happened with SolarWinds, even though you may not directly be a customer, you could have been impacted. And when Microsoft was impacted on as part of SolarWinds, we developed something that I'll talk about a little bit later that I call the Microsoft Doctrine. But when we look at the gears and we talk about the software supply chain, we live in a world today where everything is interconnected through APIs, everything is interconnected through iframes. We're, we're, we're not a single source anymore. We have multiple vendors that support multiple business functions. In some organizations, you can have two, three, five, 10, 30, 40, and 50,000 vendors that are part of your organization. How do you start to manage that risk? How do you start to address that specific risk, especially from a software perspective, right? Because what SolarWinds reminded us is that the software perspective is far more 
challenging to manage that risk than any other risk. And do our Excels, do our vendor risk management programs really operate? What kind of transparency is needed? So when we look at what happened with SolarWinds, we start to realize very quickly, SolarWinds, an isolated company um, working really largely with government and enterprise, becomes a victim from a nation state, which we'll talk about here also in just a little bit. And through that, the attack heads downstream and starts to impact not only government organizations, but I think the world's largest software provider, which is Microsoft. And initially, one of the very interesting things about SolarWinds was, what was the severity of the incident? And if you look at the blue line is at first, and the red line is now, this was done about a month and a half ago. So you see how extremely severe and went significantly up, but not severe at all didn't. It actually decreased because the severity just kept going on in time. Now, here's something very interesting we got to move beyond where we are here. And so when SolarWinds actually took place and Microsoft came out and said, we've had our source code looked at, we immediately understood. And I looked at this immediately and said, all right, here we go, folks. Tighten your seatbelts, get ready. This is a conversation we need to have. And here's the dilemma. So I call this the Microsoft doctrine. Microsoft has really paved the way for us to win over the business. They have, and, and, and here's how they done it. I call it the Microsoft Doctrine. And the folks over at Microsoft <laughs> love this, but it, it's really uh, the doctrine. Here's the idea of the doctrine. How do we create transparency when these types of events happen? So while SolarWinds was a little mum, FireEye and Microsoft were dumping information out at unprecedented levels just complete and absolute transparency, which if you're a Microsoft customer, helped you understand what are some of the TTPs and IOCs we're seeing and how do we address them. And so right then and there, we were able to take that in, go to our incident response teams and start to really deploy the idea of how do we fix this? How do we start to address these threats and then take it into the business? So let's talk about that business for a second because here's where the dilemma was. Most of you got that message, the email, the phone call, the text, the Slack message, whatever, that said, are we impacted by this? What does this mean to our company? 70 some odd percent of the world uses Microsoft. Almost all of us exclusively use Microsoft in some capacity or another, whether it be from a DevOps side to an entire organization standpoint, right? I think Microsoft Office Suite has like a 96% penetration rate. So we're all very reliant on Microsoft. So when Microsoft source code gets exposed, the Microsoft doctrine that Microsoft developed over this period of time becomes even more crucial. As they're sharing information, we're no longer looking for a needle in a haystack. We're now following specific trends that we see. And this conversation with the business now becomes much easier. So now the conversation with the business goes, Microsoft, a multi-billion dollar corporation, wasn't directly breached but it was a victim of a victim in an incident where their source code was viewed. And now everyone who's that that customer of those victims is also victimized inadvertently by this. And we saw this with the exchange, the the proxy logon vulnerabilities that happened thereafter, the idea of being able to infiltrate and get all these messages, the threat actors that jumped on this, the breach, the, 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 the different incidents that took place, All of that's been really, really critical. And this is the conversation we are now taking into the executive leadership. Look, we can do a lot of different and we can put a lot of different controls in place. But when something like this happens, we need to be business enablers. We need to change the way we look at how we work with our vendors, our SaaS vendors, our infrastructure vendors, our platform vendors. And we need to create that level of transparency. This is where you go to legal and you have the conversation with your general counsel or outside counsel of how do we create more transparency in our agreements from a cybersecurity perspective? That's a great conversation to be had with legal. It's a way to win this over. And it's a way for us to get more information, especially as practitioners. The more real live information we get, the better it is. John Felker, formerly of DHS, who ran the NKIC for CISA for for a very long time, who just recently retired, used to say that if we classify things for what they really were, we'd probably get information 
in a day rather than two weeks. A lot of times we're over-classifying specific incidents within our organization. Redline your company name, send it over, get that information out there as quick as possible so that people know so that they're able to address that. And up until this SolarWinds Microsoft Exchange incident, that's where we saw the Microsoft Doctrine come into full play, where everything is being shared, complete and absolute transparency, and it's helped us all prepare ourselves, but we can use that Microsoft Doctrine to talk about what we all need to be doing with the business, which is how we build these relationships with our vendors. And how do we look at this? When we look at the timeline, the timeline from December 10th to present has been significant. We've gone through a lot of different incidents. It almost feels like every single week something else happens, another piece of information drops, another vulnerability. And these are going to continue to happen over the next 12 to 18 months. This isn't going to stop now. When they viewed Microsoft source code, our adversaries immediately understood that they're going to be able to find vulnerabilities and take advantage of them faster than we'll ever be able to patch them. And Microsoft's going to do everything it possibly can to do this. But now these are the conversations we need to have with the business. Here's how Microsoft Exchange is going to impact us over the next 12 to 18 months. We're probably going to be looking at more vulnerabilities within Microsoft. So we're probably going to need to spend a little bit more money and identify and, and build in more security controls within Microsoft Exchange. But we also need to look at our vendors and our SaaS vendors and what are they doing. And what we need to get an inventory of uh, softwares that they're using and how those softwares integrate with the data that we send them or they send us in order for us to identify if there's any risks there. We need to make security a partnership, not a service. And when we do that, we all win. And this is the kind of conversation. The second conversation we need to have is around nation states. How can we deal with that? And when we talk about nation state threats, I like to use the movie 300. So in the movie 300, if you haven't seen it, you should go check it out. 300 warriors take on a full army. And that's what we are in cybersecurity when we're in nation state. We're 300. We're 300 motivated, willing to do everything we can to defend and protect our organizations, our businesses, our livelihoods, our integrity. It's our name. It's our reputation that's at the, on the line. But at the same time, our enemy is far more sophisticated. They cooperate better than we do amongst ourselves most of the time. They really do cooperate if you haven't spent some time with your threat intel team, if you haven't gone and checked that, we need to look at that. And we need to address that in the idea of how do we create more transparency? And that's why the Microsoft doctrine is really critical because we can use Microsoft as a way to win the board and win the executive leadership in order to understand the need for transparency. So as we look at the 300 example, right? We have to fight a battle where we might lose from the very beginning. We don't have limitless resources. We have budgets. We don't have limitless people. We've only got a few on our budget to do that, right? Resources wise, we're only as good as what we've got. And that also applies to our role, the type of organization. Not everyone has, you know, a billion dollars like JP Morgan Chase does to invest in cyber. So how do we stretch our budget? And now we become 300. And I love this because now we go and we're able to defend our organizations better that way. So now let's talk business. Let's understand that the software supply chain risks represent the greatest single threat to our organizations. And now let's have the conversation with our business, whether it be marketing, finance, operations, DevOps, engineering, architecture, infrastructure, about what does that mean when we're on the cloud and we're working with AWS or Azure or the Google Cloud Platform or any other one, okay? And unless we tighten our belts within the software supply chain and we start to understand the threats that exist there as CISOs to elevate that conversation, then we become real business enablers. And we stand to be victims if we don't do that. And this is where we don't use FUD, we talk in the business terms. So we can lower costs, we can increase our operational uh, continuity by investing and working with more transparent organizations as part of our vendors. Sitting together with all the key stakeholders and setting a, what kind of transparency do we want from our vendors who take specific data from us? And what does that transparency mean to us as an organization? Meaning, hey, marketing, you're working with all these different companies that are bringing you, that are doing demand generation and lead generation and getting people's PII possibly. 
So what does it mean for us? What's the standard we want to have with organizations you work with? And what's the red line where we say we won't work with the SaaS vendor or infrastructure vendor or platform vendor? Having these conversations now is so important because that's what everyone is seeing. The hearings in Congress, the hearings in Senate, um, the newspaper articles, the coverage of solar winds and the impact that it has on our nation and on our organizations is the time for us to take those same conversations. And when we're dealing with nation state actors, we're dealing with the 300. They're coming with thousands. The Chinese have hundreds of thousands of state sponsored criminals. They call them hackers that are working for them to infiltrate and steal IP and steal data in order to mine it, in order to give themselves an advantage. So how do we address that conversation? How do we address the Russian threat? How do we address the Iranian threat? How do we address how do we address the North Korean threat? And what does that all mean for us within the boardroom? Those are all very important conversations to have because I'm fairly certain that we need to address this from a legislative perspective. And that's why the, some of the mission that the NTSC does, the National Technology Security Coalition, is doing on the Hill is significant, including the federal data breach notification law that we should be talking to our boardroom about to support because our companies are able to put in some weight to get those bills passed quicker. The federal data privacy uh, bill that's on the table right now. These are conversations we need to be having with our general counsels, with if you're working in a large enough organizations where you have some governmental affairs, these are the conversations we need them to take. These reduce our costs, allows us to spend more on security and less on compliance and really streamlines our processes. There's some very sensible cybersecurity legislation that's taken place. Now let's address that from a business perspective and when the business, and we have to debate business operations versus operational risk and understanding that over the long term. And one of very important thing we need to do is get out of our echo chamber. I do about six cybersecurity talks with cybersecurity professionals a year. I do 20 others with people who aren't in cyber. And I challenge every practitioner to do the same. Step out of our echo chamber. Go talk to CFOs. Go talk to COOs. Go talk to v CMOs, chief revenue officer. Talk to those people. Go and attend their conferences. Listen. Understand where security ranks and understand how they view security so you're able to break down these walls and really have the business conversation. We in security oftentimes are within our own echo chambers. We believe everything we see because we see it. But now we have the opportunity to really step away from it. COVID has allowed us to really attend outside of security functions virtually without having the need to do anything. I've attended so many virtual events with CEOs and CFOs and CIOs and CTOs over the last year where I've listened in, where I've attended and I've listened in. And now I understand better what they're looking for from their security folks. I've been able to engage with them and pick their brains. And I think that's really important for us to do is get out of our echo chamber. And it comes to my favorite part, which is said, be a CISO, they said. It's fun whenever someone says, hey, James, I want to become a CISO. What do I need to do? I, <laughs> I laugh and I go, um, do you enjoy sleep? They go, yes. I go, CISO probably isn't a thing for you. Do you enjoy uh, <laughs> having weekends and nights off and be, spending time with your family? And they go, absolutely, that's critical. I go, being a CISO probably isn't a thing for you. And that comes with great power and our limited power comes great responsibilities. And I love this image right here. It's the CIO versus the CISO, right? And this image to me is everything. It's what's the responsibilities of a CIO versus a CISO. CIO, purely IT, CISO, let's talk about it. I did a post on LinkedIn about two months ago, really highlighting all the different responsibilities a CISO would have, matching it with what a CIO would or a CEO would have. And you know what? We should be deputy CEOs at our point. Like when you're a CISO, yes, you bust your tail and you're the first scapegoat when something happens, but at the same time, you're able to build your career, your brand, your name to become the next business leader. And that's why what I said earlier, within 10 years, some of the people that are watching this today, 
And some of the people that we've been listening to over the last several years will be CEOs of organizations because the role of the CISA will be elevated to that where we have the complete understanding of the business and we also bring that security piece. And that's really, really important. I wanted to share the CISA mind map because I think that's the overview of responsibilities. And I love this, right? From a budget, an architecture, project delivery lifecycle, business enabling from merger and acquisitions, processes, cloud computing, and mobile technology, to selling InfoSec internally and selling InfoSec externally. How can you monetize InfoSec outside the business? Have that conversation. Could you work with sales? Have you shadowed your sales team? Have you seen how they use InfoSec in the sales process? Attribute that, build a premium value so that you can go and say, Yes, we exceeded revenue this month, this quarter by $25 million and security was responsible for 17 million because we were able to help sales really close deals that were stuck in the pipeline because of this. We need to hire better people who are able to go cross organizations and reach out. That's something very significant as well. Governance, security operations, identity management, risk management, legal and compliance and audits, and we can keep going. That kind of brings us into the idea of being business enablers. And that's really important as business enablers to look at the business as a whole, to stand there and really start to have the conversations where we're bringing all of the language together, where we're not using FUDs, where we transition security talk into business talk, where we take our lingo that we use at events and but within ourselves and we translate it into business conversations. How do we increase our operational continuity? How do we improve the every aspect of the business that we do and how can we do that better? And I think we can do that because we're smart enough, we're capable enough to be able to do it there. We just have to have the right conversation and update our vocabulary. And when I do the CISO Talk podcast, I've had 110 CISOs on my show. And one of the awesome things that I've learned over time is there's so many ways that we can really enhance our role in our position that we stand to really, really benefit from it. And so I, I really do want us to use our ability to be able to mag magnify our roles and improve our position by looking at business operation and business lingo. Take an MBA class from a local university in business MBA, understand what are some of the trends that are happening in business. Um, if you haven't done that, you should be doing that. Work with HR, HR significant. Work with HR and understand what HR does when they're looking to hire people across the entire organization. I think that's also a very important question. Um, and so we need to look at the software supply chain we need to understand how do we convert that into business and then build that into a business enabler. And I want to say the final thing here before, before we close, which is when you're sitting in front of the board and the board is talking about SolarWinds, Microsoft Exchange, the need for security investment, the liability and the risks that exist for the organization, we're always tempted to say we need more money. And a lot of times, one of the great ways to win this over is we need to create more business partnerships. We need to elevate the role of the CISO before we ask for more money. And when we elevate our role, then money never becomes an issue. So when you're sitting across from the board, here's a few takeaways you can, you can have with them really specifically to talk about this is one, security is no longer an IT issue. It's a business enabler. And so we need to understand from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, from operationals, finance, and so forth. Fraud falls under security. And if you don't see it that way, you need to explain that to the board. I've sat with the board multiple times to explain why fraud, all fraud, should be under security. One, it helped elevate us from a perspective of investigation and being able to save money for the organization, which within a quarter of a pilot, we were able to do. And the second aspect is, yes, it did add more to it, but it helped get, it helped build a very significant bridge with our finance team and with our operations team. So now they understand and value security so much more. Now you got to have the right people in place and you got to have the right attitude and the culture, but you control that. Those are the things that we can control. We can go and really build those bridges. And the final thing I would say is take this, um, take this into a position where you're able to create transparency with your partners. 
And the way to create transparency with your partners is to work with legal on agreements that allow you to get more information from your critical vendors. And we're not talking about every single vendor. Identify the most critical vendors that are part of your organization and work with them on finding a way to get transparency and an inventory audit or anything like that beyond a SOC 2 report, beyond a ISO 27001 certification. And I know those are challenging tasks, but if we focus on those tasks right now, the time is right. And we're leveraged in the right position to be able to go to the business and really win these battles. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it back for some Q&A. Um, again. All right, so um, thank you, James. We do have a couple of comments. I have one that says, um, yes, can we have a vice president responsible for privacy and security? However, moving CISO above technical aspects of security or privacy may not align the business missions goals with the solution security and privacy mitigation technology implements and enforces. Most CISOs are more technology man managed minded and not called business minded, just in my humble opinion. That's absolutely true. I think that's one of the challenges that exists that that's been really prevalent over um, the CISO role over the, the period of time is the fact that we've been very technical, we've been isolated and almost put in this realm that's specifically IT and not business. So that's why I encourage CISOs to go to and, and, and take an MBA in business or take a few business classes and attend business events and not just cyber events. So you're able to verse yourself so you can have those conversations. You, you know, you can't just learn business by staying in our security echo chamber. And I think that's something that that's really interesting when we do cyber events, Kim, is the idea of could we enable more business in our conversations beyond just security? Could we really bring in business drivers and business enablers to talk about how security can elevate its role within the organization? Because yeah, we're facing an uphill battle, but these uphill battles have historically happened before right? The CIO and IT had that before. People all remember when IT was in the dark closet, then IT got elevated and security took their spot. But now we're getting out of that dark closet. And in order to really excel and move quickly through the steps, we need to become business-minded individuals and not just security-minded individuals. So this would be a question for me. Um, what would you say, because our viewers are probably 50% C-level and then 50 percent senior directors, directors. So how did they support their CISO and what's your advice to them as far as moving up and the next steps they should take? So I think if you look at, you know, the director level, uh, that, that's one of my favorite questions, Kim, um, because when when I talk to people and I'm, and I'm mentoring several people who are wanting to move into the CISO role, we talk about the idea of that's great that you've got your CISSP or CISM, those are wonderful certs. They're going to get you to the interview. But the way to get to that CISO role is to become business-minded. Go in and present something that makes you more, uh, that gives you an advantage than someone else who's applying for the role. So how do you address the business? Have you met with key stakeholders um, and spoken to people in within that organization about what are some of the key goals for the business? And have you aligned that so when you're interviewing for the job, you're aligning your security plan and your security lingo to the business language. I mean, vocabulary is everything. A word has to have a meaning. And if we understand what you know critical KPIs are for the business, what are the revenue generators for the business, and we take those right into security, we're able to really break down those walls. And we're really able to address that. So if you're looking to become, if you're just getting started in security or you've been in security for a few years and you wanna elevate yourself, that's great to do some of the security certs, but if you're gonna do, let's say, two continued education things a year, do one in security and do one in business and elevate yourself so that you're able to understand that and reach out to the business within the organization and say, hey, can I shadow you for a few days? I really wanna understand a little bit more about what you guys are doing. I'm interested. Go sit with DevOps, go sit with engineering, go sit with marketing, go sit with sales, go sit with business development, with finance, and understand what, what does a day in their life look like? What are some of their challenges that they're going through? And could you, could you possibly be able to enable them? Don't be the I know it all guy. Sit there, watch, take notes, see their frustrations, and then 
think of ways that we can be business enablers there. Because I think that's critical. That's how you move up. That's how you're able to really elevate your role and go into a place where not only do people respect you, but you have real value for the organization as a whole. So Dale made a comment and it was something you were speaking um, on earlier. You realize it's impossible to get a list of software (laughs) that a third party vendor is using, right? I don't know that that's impossible. I've been able to do it. Um, I don't think anything's impossible if you team up with legal and you team up with the business. And I think that's why I wanted to talk about this dilemma today, right? Uh, Nothing is impossible if the right agreement's in place and we have the right attitude in place when we approach it with the vendor. So a lot of times security practitioners, we rarely ever speak with our counterparts and companies we work with. Why? Why are we so hidden from this? Why are we hiding from, 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 from being able to speak to, to our, to our counterparts in other organizations. If they've got an inventory list and you've got an inventory list and you're both being very transparent, i.e. the Microsoft doctrine, right? There's no reason why we can't cooperate and you don't want their entire list of it. But Congress right now, by the way, in in something that we're working on is talking about creating a, a nutritional fact for software, a label of everything that's being used in a software on all software uh, applications going forward. That's something that's right now in committee. It's something that we're all pushing for. And I think every practitioner should call their representative and say, we need a software nutritional fact. A nutritional fact like you would on a soda or a snack that you buy where everyone grabs it, looks at the back and go, oh, this is a 300 calories and it's got so much sodium, Never mind. I'll put this back. It's probably not healthy for me. The same should apply with software today. And because of SolarWinds and because of Microsoft Exchange, there's a real movement for change there. So James, I am surprised because I watch your shows all the time and you actually finished your session early. You finished it about 15 minutes early and I'm very, very surprised by that. We have, I just looked at the operations council. I can see there's 200 people watching the session so a lot of silent people that aren't asking questions. So I guess they're all still waking up. But James is going to be, he'll be over on the event side. So if anybody has any questions for him, he'll be around. You can just go up to the network lounge. You can see everyone who's here today. And James, you want to just let our audience know um, where they can find you on your Cyber Hub podcast and also on your Tech Town. Just let them know where they can, you know, sign up for that, follow you. And all sure. That so best place to connect with me is on LinkedIn, James J. Azar. Um, and, and I won't tell you why there's a J in my name, but it has something to do with spam messages. Um, <laughs> you can go, follow the Cyber Hub podcast or the CISO Talk podcast on any of your favorite podcast listening platform. Or if you go to YouTube, you can um, follow the Cyber Hub podcast page there as well. All of our content is in video and audio format. So it's there as well, cyberhubpodcast.com. Um, where all of our uh, content is as well. And um, what else? Oh, the Tech Town Square. It's live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, where Eddie and I have a very open conversation about um, everything that's going on in not only security, but technology in general. Um, And yesterday we talked about nation states last night. And I think you, Kim, you kind of joined early on and then unfortunately you couldn't stick around, but we started talking about how nation states are now training terrorist groups uh, with cyber capabilities as, as, as part of another way to create another set of threats for organizations. Um, and then, oh, Mohammed asks, can you touch on the legislative status of the software security laws? Yeah. So right now there are, um, for, um, I work a lot on, on Capitol Hill. I've spent time with the NTSC, the National Technology Security Coalition, and I've spent time working with uh, several congressmen and senators on some of the cybersecurity legislation that's that's right now pending and we're looking at. So from a software perspective, there's a lot of very interesting proposals um, going on from the nutritional facts on all software to the idea of creating deterrence through legislation on specific cybersecurity incidents like SolarWinds, like Microsoft Exchange. From that perspective, there's three bills that are right now on the floor, the cleared committee, and hopefully we'll get those passed over the next month or so 
Um, the hope was to get the, the federal data breach notification law that's been uh, discussed for six years uh, through now. Um, and hopefully that'll get done in this session. Um, we're optimistic that it can get done in this session, but the federal data breach notification law essentially overrules all the state data breach notification and going forward, you'll just notify the FTC and the FTC would notify everything, but going forward, you'd only report to one body, which would be the, the FTC. And that's that. So that would reduce about 40% of breach costs for organizations because it would take down the breach notification uh, down to just the FTC and the FTC and the AGs would be the state attorney generals would be working on that. There's the federal uh, data privacy law, kind of a US version of GDPR, a little bit based of CCPA. And also it's, it's now being added some of the Illinois biometric law that exists in, 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 in the state of Illinois all together to create a federal um, privacy bill that's also on the floor as we speak Hopefully that'll get passed in this session. If not this session, then the, the fall session of the house and be there to go from it. The solar winds, post solar winds, there's been a bunch of hearings. There's a few more hearings still due over the next several weeks on the idea of the software supply chain. Uh, part of it has to do with the idea of making a the software supply chain nutritional fact a requirement for federal agencies. And that's something where it might end up being an executive order that will drop by the end of this month. Um, I know that Ms. Ann Neuberger, who's the cybersecurity advisor to the president, is something that they've written up already and are looking. They're getting some industry feedback on it as well to get a great an executive order that would essentially require anyone who works with the federal government. So if you're in the business of providing software to the federal government, you'll be required to have that nutritional fact uh, of all of your software resources available um, at all times. So that, that is probably going to go through an executive order and we'll probably see it within a year or two, hopefully, uh, passed within, within Congress and becoming law. Michael um, said, in your opinion, was solar winds discovery luck or good technical discovery? Good technical discovery. I think the people at FireEye did an unbelievable job of, of um discovering this this specific breach doing the attribution following it through to solar winds and um and really putting forward the facts early on we don't talk about fire eye as much anymore but fire eye were the first to fire the gun and they started with the doctrine of transparency they pretty much laid it all out and then microsoft took that and upped them it was like a las vegas gambling table but the good kind right where microsoft was like oh you think you're a transparent fire eye boom, we're going to put everything out there. And I'm grateful to Microsoft for this because I think Microsoft is now allowing us to take this conversation to the business and say, look what Microsoft's doing. And it didn't cost them anything. In fact, it's only improved their position in the marketplace. More people want to do business with them because of that. Well, it looks like, oh, nope, I have another question. Um, won't the U.S. government muck it up and cause less transparency? Why not just pass the GDPR that the U.K. and EU has? Um, so I don't know that GDPR really. So GDPR itself, personal opinion. OK, let me just preface with that. GDPR is a cash grab. It's not a real privacy law. It gives you the ability to delete your information and requires the company to delete your information. But it's more designed to get big companies that the EU has set up kind of a, uh, a, a tax shelter in Ireland. And GDPR was a way to get all these big tech companies that get all this data um, that operate within the EU to pay EU fines and essentially um, um, it, it, it's a makeup tax. The federal data, uh, the federal privacy law is an actual federal privacy law and it has less to do with punishing a company for being a victim and more given rights to Americans to know what's happening with their data and take complete control of their data, which is a little bit different from what GDPR um, does slightly um, because GDPR does give you the right to, um, to have access to your data, but it also finds victims of crime. And I think that's a, that's a double-edged sword. And I think that's something we don't need to have in the federal bill here is punishing a company that's a victim of a crime. And it's refreshing to hear bipartisan support about that, which is if you're a victim of a crime, why in the world would you want to um, pay an additional fine for the government unless it's pure negligence? So it looks like we have 
about 30 seconds and there was one more. Now all the questions are rolling in. Um, <laughs> when will self-certification have more teeth in it? Very interesting. I think when you have an, if, if software nutritional facts become a industry standard for all software, then that will become um, more of, it'll have a little bit more teeth than anything else. But self-certification to me is still, um, it just depends on the organization. So, of course, all of a sudden, right at the end, everybody comes up with all kinds That's of questions. That's how it always is, Kim. It is. It I know. Is. It takes one person, and then they – so there's there's more questions. But, James, well, unfortunately, with the virtual platform, it just cuts us off. Now, at live <laughs> events, my keynote speakers, they don't listen to me. They just keep going. So um, we're a little mandated by this virtual platform. So thanks so much, James. James will be around over in the um, network lounge. If anybody has any other questions, thanks for um, spending an hour with us, James. It was great to see you again. I look forward to seeing you in person. Thanks for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Kim, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. All I right. really appreciate it. Thank